morning. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. And today we're going to talk about the middle way. The middle way is a show about China. And we have our old friend Russell Liu. He joins us uh, from Honolulu. And Chang Wang, he joins us from the Midwest. Uh, he's, a, he's a practicing lawyer and an academic in the Midwest. Uh, Chang, where are you exactly? Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, the Chinese in America, especially here on uh, Martin Luther King Day. <clears throat> we're going to talk about the civil rights movement and how um, that has affected Chinese Americans. Um, and I suppose the history of uh, Chinese Americans in the United States, which is not so simple and not so pretty. Russell, you want to lead off, give us a little background? Yes. Good morning, Jay. And good morning, Chang. Um, uh, Jay, it's a pleasure to be on this show again. Um, the Middle Way really is a, a show which we are attempting to bridge between uh, China and the U.S. Um, all of us have had unique experiences, um, you know, uh, being in China and the U.S. And this show, Jay, being the middle of the Pacific, it's the Asian Pacific century. So that's why we're called Middle Way. But today's topic, what we're talking about is really the the what does Martin Luther King Day, the civil rights movement, means to Chinese Americans and how it's viewed um, in the different segments of the of the Asian American community, the Chinese American. And um, so we have a very, a very interesting discussion and viewpoint. And, and the overriding consensus we start off with, and I'll pass it back to Jay, is that, you know, um, th this is Martin Luther King uh, Day today. And so it's really a mixed bag on, on how the Chinese Americans view um, the Martin Luther King Day and the civil rights movement. And it depends what generation you're in. Um, I was had a little quip with uh, uh, Chang Wang. We're talking about we have friends who are uh, first generation f immigrants from China, as well as some of our Chinese academic scholars in China, the progressives who who all embraced Donald Trump uh, and who have very little knowledge of uh, the civil rights movement. And it's ironic. And and you know, let me uh, pass it to to Jay and then Chang. You can to to share some of the thoughts there. Well, let me let me go to uh, let me go to some of the history here. A couple of thoughts, just to sort of paint the canvas. Um, one is um, the Chinese had a terrible time in the 19th century. Things weren't so good in China, and they and they came for these jobs on the railroad in the west, and they were treated badly. But their culture carried them through. I think the most interesting story that sticks in my mind is the story of uh, typhoid. And um, what, what happened on the railroads is that uh, there were two kinds of workers. There were the Chinese and there were the Haoles. <clears throat> and the Haoles were dying at a rapid rate, getting very sick over typhoid. Um, the, the Chinese uh, knew how to cook their food and boil their water, and they survived. They didn't have a problem with that at all. And so what you, know, what you, what you have is a cultural strength in Chinese and in China. And that should be a thread of our show today, that cultural strength, because it differentiates the Chinese as a culture from many, many other cultures. The other thing is that the uh, United States was not kind to the Chinese in the 20th century. Um, and I think um, right, on, right on through from the uh, immigration limitations, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the McCarran-Walters Act in uh, 1921. Um, they, they've had a rough time over immigration and they haven't been treated well. But over, over, over the years, I think the Chinese have done well in integrating. Um, they have stuck together as families and communities and that has helped them. Um, and so that, that cultural strength again has helped them. But then um, arrives Trump and he takes us backward. Um, he tries to do a scapegoat on uh, Xi Jinping and China and every, Chi every Chinese person in the country suffers over that um, because um, you know, he's been blaming them for the COVID, which is really inappropriate. Um, and finally, I, I wanna get to the point that uh, Chang, Chang Wang made before the show began and that is that there are a lot of Chinese who support Trump. And I want to examine how many, I mean, in, in broad terms and why. Good morning, Chang. Tell us, tell us your thoughts about whether there are Chinese people in this country um, who, who support Trump and why. Uh, 
Good morning, Jay, and good morning, Russell. Thank you for having me on the show. So let, let's start with the statistics. So in 2020 election, according to the Asian Pacific the Justice Project, uh, the Chinese American voting, 56% voting blue and 20% voting Trump and the Republican. So, and there are 23% they are considering themselves independent. And and this is not this is very uh, consistent with other major Asian American communities like Korean fifty seven for Democrats and uh, uh, Filipino fifty two percent for uh, Democrats and thirty four percent for Republican and it, uh, there are two uh, extreme examples among the Asian American community that is a Vietnamese vast majority voting Republican, 43%, uh, and only 36% voting Democrats. And on the, uh, on the opposite, the Indian American community, only 28% voting Republican and 65% voting Democrats. So with this all this said, but there is a, a very loud voice among the Chinese American community supporting Trump agenda, uh, even including the racial discrimination against the Chinese. It's a very bizarre phenomenon, but uh, as Russell said, we have to distinguish different generation of immigrants. The second generation or above, third generation, fourth generation, there are very, very few Trump supporters, as we can observe. But among the first generation Chinese immigrants in this country, there is a considerable, is a critical mass, a very loud voice uh, supporting Trump, supporting Trump's agenda, anti-immigration, and even the anti-Chinese rhetoric. So again, we consider this is very bizarre, but they are both uh, a deeper uh, reason for that, and there are some uh, apparent reason for that. Apparent reason to uh, to to uh, keep my response short. The apparent, the the most obvious reason is this first generation. Chinese Americans, they do not, they are not familiar with American culture, cultural norm, the political system, judicial system, and they get uh, mo almost all of their information from WeChat, from some uh, uh, WeChat group, it's like Chinese version of Facebook and Twitter. So there are a lot of misinformation, disinformation rapidly spread among Chinese American communities. So that is the uh, um, most obvious reason, but there's a deeper reason. And that is what Russell and I considered why the civil rights movement is vitally important for the new immigrants to understand, because this is part of your public education, uh, citizen education, it's part of your gene. But for a lot of new immigrants, the civil rights movement is a, its legacy. Uh, it, they are not common sense to them, and this is not something it, they inherited from their parents. So they have to learn from the very beginning. So that I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have this conversation on Martin Luther King Day. Yeah, well, it's important that we have this conversation today. I want to mention that you talk about uh, the Chinese, uh, I mean, a, a, a significant number of Chinese who essentially are um, voting against their interests when they support Trump, because Trump is not friendly to the Chinese at all. And he has created an environment in this country where if you walk down the street in you know, dozens of American cities, um, you ask people, what do you think of the Chinese? They will come out with a negative remark. Um, and they will, you know, remember at the beginning when he was blaming them, nobody wanted to go to Chinese restaurant. Remember that? Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, and that was that was just a superficial kind of thing. But he's been he's been racist um, to so many races, including the Chinese. And it always amazes me that the Chinese will, or that any group like that, will support him when he is working against them, and they are therefore working against their own interests. Another another group that falls that comes to mind is, is Latinos. A lot of Latinos support Trump. But he, you know, he hates Latinos. He, remember, he's the guy that wanted to build the wall. He's the guy that treated the children so badly and, and the immigrants from the South so badly. And yet a lot of Latinos support him. Uh, that's hard to understand. It's worth, you know, having another show on that point. 
But here we are on Martin Luther King Day, and I think what's interesting here is to compare, you know, the Chinese experience in the United States with the African American experience in the United States, and see what the similarities and differences are. And as you say, Chang, um, you know, what can we learn from all of that? We, we need to be aware of it, and the Chinese, as a, a parallel, you know, trajectory, they need to be aware of it. In fact, every minority group needs to be aware of it. All, let me say this, all minority groups need to be aware of, of, of racial, um, preference, racial um, you know, bias um, and prejudice against other minority groups. <laughs> we, we can exactly. solve this problem. I don't understand why you know, the schools have not helped us, but they have not helped us. Then we have a, a threat in American society that keeps on going. And uh, a guy like Trump just exacerbates it. So, Russell, can you help me compare the Chinese cultural experience, both both the Chinese who have lived in this country, you know, for 170 years? I mean, the Chinese came in 1850 or so to Hawaii and probably earlier to the mainland. Um, can you help me understand the Chinese cultural experience and the cultural you know, uh, uh, parameters, the cultural characteristics of Chinese living in the United States um, for a long time, as opposed to the African-American experience who have lived mm -hmm. in the United States for 400 years, mm -hmm. but they came as slaves. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, Jay, that's a very good question. I think, I think first I would look to the similarities a lot for the um, second, third, fourth generation uh, Chinese Americans who have grown up in the U.S. You know, actually, there's a lot of similarities in the history in the in the, uh, the Chinese that came here really came uh, from China as indentured servants, as we know, uh, to build the railways, uh, to build to work on the plantations, and and roughly, you know, if you read some of the actual uh, the actual diaries which I've read, uh, they were treated very very, very badly. They could not intermarry for one thing. They could not uh, bring, they didn't want to bring, uh, they wouldn't allow Chinese women to come here. Uh, so many uh, of the men uh, ended up, a lot of them intermarrying. As we know, in Hawaii, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of Chinese who could not uh, bring women, so they had to intermarry with the Hawaiian women. Uh, so that's, a, that's part of the history where it's, it's a lot of that shared background. Um, and you know many things happened along the way. They had, uh, they were they were not allowed to vote. Their, uh, you know, their many of their civil liberties that they did not have. Um, and uh, again, uh, so that's the, the experiences that that Chinese Americans have the the, the generations that have been here. And I, I know I, I also have friends who are the first generations from China, and, and their very point is very different because they haven't shared or have ever felt what demonstration uh, is. You know, uh, they don't have that same sentiment, and and they kind of remind me of the uh, the Latino community in Florida, where many of them have a political orientation uh, uh, that they are going to be strong Americans. So what that means is equates to becoming uh, a, a certain kind of American uh, uh, that share in the same thoughts as the uh, people who actually uh, rioted, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. Um, it's interesting, the Proud Boys, the leader is actually a, uh, comes from a Latino background. He is half African-American, half Cuban. And it, a lot of the Cuban community in Florida actually supports Trump, you know. Uh, again, um, so I think there are uh, a lot of Chinese who uh, have come here uh, recently who support Trump. And I think there's a second uh, uh, dimension to that. There's a lot of the uh, Chinese uh, that who come here and immigrate to the U.S., um, they look at a world where they have to work very hard. They will sacrifice everything for their children. So they are um, not in line with some of the democratic ideals, uh, um, you know, helping the uh, uh, indigent, poor, uh, they feel that uh, they have to do on their own and nobody should be given a, a so-called, uh, as they see in their mind, a handout. So yeah, that, know, I think I, that's an important point. And uh, Chang, you know, is uh, more like first generation, call him Issei. <laughs> 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 and I, and I, I, I wonder, um, you know, there's a huge difference between a Chinese family, because family is so important, um, that has lived here for 100, 170 years, 
um, and a, a Chinese uh, person who has come over in recent years. And I'm reminded, <laughs> it's just a flashback, but uh, in Vancouver, uh, which is a largely Chinese community, um, uh, and the Chinese people there have brought money with them from China, maybe to, you know, be safe, to, 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 to have a, a, a plan, uh, you know, when China might uh, try to take their money or worse. Um, so they bring their money to, to Canada and they buy these fabulous condominiums on the water in Vancouver and they are the community there. And you say to yourself, uh, gee, that's different. That's different than the people who came here 170 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wonder if you can speak to what has happened in your time, in our time, if you will, um, to the, the, the change in the Chinese visitor who turns to be an immigrant who settles in the United States, say, uh, in, a, in a first generation wave of immigration. Thank you, Jay. It's, let's limit our discussion to, for, to the first generation Chinese immigrants for now. For the purpose of our discussion, the for the first generation Chinese immigrants basically start from we have to say that why we are in debt to the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement led to 1964 Civil Rights Act signed by LBJ, and then next lead to the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 which eliminated the immigration quota and dramatically increased the immigration from the uh, Asian countries. And after that, the immigrants from Asian countries become a significant, became a significant, that after 1965 Immigration Act. And the fourth wave of Chinese immigrants to the United States were not from mainland China, but are actually from Taiwan. It's understandable because in 1965 to, until 1979, there was no diplomatic relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China. The, the official diplomatic relationship was with the United States and the Republic of China, which was in Taiwan. And in 1979, President Jimmy Carter uh, re-established, according to the Chinese terminology, re-established the diplomatic relationship between Beijing and Washington and uh, 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 Taiwan is, uh, was out in 1979. And only after 1970, so before 1979, the first generation immigrants from Asian countries, from China were from mostly from Taiwan and Hong Kong. Then after 1979 and in early 1980s, the Chinese, in mainland the Chinese began to study abroad and it began to come to United States from uh, uh, come to other countries to friend their family relative and uh, recital uh, elsewhere. So that in 1980s, you'll see a large wave of immigrants from mainland China to United States and to Europe and also to other Asian countries. That's 1980s. So they are still living today. It's uh, the, the, the only about you know 35 years ago. So the first wave of Chinese immigrants still now they are already some of them are already grandparents. They are from mainland China. Those of they they share strikingly similar background. Most of them are academics and they come they came here to study uh, mostly at a graduate level. Because yeah, that's, that's a very important point. I should have made that point myself. Yes. Uh, a lot of the waves of immigrants from China over our lifetimes have been for academic purposes, for study, um, and um, in, you know, in, in various areas, but especially including science, but um, medicine, um, technology, and they've done very well. And you know, I like to add that um, you know they've stayed here. It's a, it's a story that has been repeated millions of times they've stayed here and they've um you know done well so mm -hmm. and and look at you i mean for example um the lawyers the lawyers i remember how mm, interesting it was that the government and the uh, chinese bar associations were encouraging lawyers to go overseas and study law to take master's degrees uh, in various law schools all over the country and in europe uh, and they did. It was, uh, it, I guess, it was it's a career path, and uh, thousands, m maybe even millions, hundreds of thousands, anyway, of lawyers from China took those graduate degrees, including right here in Honolulu, at the University mm -hmm. of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, yeah. and I guess a, a, a fair number of them uh, stayed. Some of them went back to China. Some of them stayed. Some of them stayed to practice law. And there are a lot of lawyers like you, Chang, uh, who were born in China, uh, but who trained in U.S. law and who um, are practicing in various areas, not only, and what's interesting, not only in big firms, but in small firms. It's an entrepreneurial activity, and it's really all over the country. And uh, I don't think people realize the, you know, the degree to which um, the Chinese lawyers are successful in the practice of law all over. No, thank you, Jay. Uh, this is the first ground, uh, great wave of immigrants from mainland China that was in 1980s. And then the second wave is from uh, the 1990s, late 1990s to early 2000. And I was among this wave, the second wave. And uh, I have to, uh, uh, to say that probably the first wave was STEM majored. And because they, are, they, they, they were more eager to learn STEM uh, disciplines. And for the second wave, there are more humanity, economics, and law majored graduate students uh, from mainland China. And then the third wave, most recent, and uh, mostly under uh, George W. and Obama administration, that they were coming here to settle. They were not coming here to study. The vast majority of new immigrants in the third wave uh, in the twenty uh, in the twenty first century, they were they were, they were you know as you mentioned the the, uh, the immigrants you saw in Vancouver, they were pretty wealthy middle class or upper middle class. They came here to Canada and United States to transfer the wealth out of mainland China, and they resettle here. And they probably want to retire here or at least purchase the second or the third home here. And they want to also send want to send their kids to the elite school in North America. This is third wave. The so back to our original you know, observation, there were a lot of Chinese uh, Americans, they don't quite uh, identify with the core value of this country, which is the equal protection due process and the rule of law. They strongly support some, you know, uh, very uh, hatred uh, speech by the uh, authority. Uh, they were, most of them, or from our own observation, all of them are from the third wave of immigrants from the mainland none of them very few of them are from the first gen first wave or the second wave who we came here to study and to to uh, view the united states as the beacon of the freedom of the uh, humanity and came here to identify with the core value of this country that's a little bit different and but the the, the third wave those very strong uh, Chinese American Trump supporters, they make a very, very vocal voice. You see some, you know, flyer Chinese American for Trump everywhere, and there's a mass de disinformation and misinformation campaign spread it on Facebook uh, and WeChat. Even New York Times published a, a several featured article regarding this phenomenon, which is disappointing and disheartening to people like Ross and me. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting, uh, I think it's important to recognize that for, with each succeeding wave, um, the, the Chinese immigrants have become more liberal and less likely to support Trump. Um, and um, now here we are in Martin Luther King Day. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, uh, is, is, have they come together? Do they support as a group or m maybe individually the, the MLK movement and the Black Lives, Ladder, or Black Lives Matter movement? Um, is there a convergence and why? I think Russell, you'll have some I, uh, good thing to I say mean, about this. I think, Jay, that it's still a work in progress. I think as, as Chang has pointed out, the different uh, generations, waves of uh, Chinese Americans that have come to America have to some extent varying degrees of, of uh, experiencing the American culture. And um, I think, and Jay, I think maybe it's the fourth generation. Um, the very recent, you know, I have a lot of law students where I teach uh, from China that come to the U.S. And I'm amazed that the English liter literacy uh, profession is very high, so they read more. They, they're able to read uh, the different viewpoints, the same level as an American. And I think this 
new wave that's maybe after the third wave that are coming into areas like law and humanities, you know, may um, start to learn it better, uh, understand it better. Um, and I've seen that because some of my former law students from China who actually come here and are doing very well, Jay, I'm, I'm going to tell you that one of them uh, is like a 3.92 GPA at, at a top 10 law school in the U.S. You know, she's competing with all of them. It happens all the time. You know, you, you, know go, you look at the, the leaders of the classes and the Chinese are right up there at the and, top of the class. But and, let me but let me go back to the point of uh, the merger or the support of the Black Lives matter movement um you know there are a lot of cultural differences the chinese have never lost their their uh, emphasis on education and family um and on business but i think those you know to me those three things are important cultural parameters for the chinese uh, and chinese immigrants and those things are not necessarily baked into the black lives matter movement mm -hmm. um you know the the, the african americans uh, were slaves for a long time um, and to the extent they had a culture in Africa um, that was uh, tamped down by being a slave for a long time. They didn't have the opportunity at all to do you know, any of that. They didn't even have the opportunity in many cases to retain family, much less education, much less business. Those, those parameters that you find in the Chinese thread of culture elsewhere and here um, are really different. Let so me my question to is, the question to you is, you know, given those similarities um, in terms of, you know, looking for civil rights between the uh, African-Americans and the Chinese, uh, what are the points of connection now? What are the points on which a Chinese person, a Chinese immigrant, or a Chinese who has lived here for 170 years, um, you know, f find uh, as a common denominator with, with the African-American community? Let me add something to Jay real quickly. Um, I think the, the thing that they find in common was in 1982. Um, I think what shook the Asian American, Chinese American world was the uh, brutal killing of uh, Vincent Chin, who was supposed to get married and was caught in a bar in Detroit. Uh, it was an anti-Japanese uh, time because the Japanese were developing cars that were, uh, and these two guys had lost their jobs in American car, and they beat him to death. And these guys didn't go to jail. And that was a flashpoint, as I see it, uh, uh, where the Chinese Americans all galvanized and said, wake up. This has happened to us too long. It never thought about it. And now we fast forward to the George Floyd uh, incident. It galvanized more to say, this is what's been going on. But now we have smartphone camera videos that are showing live. This is what happened. And I think for the Chinese American, the fact that the uh, U.S. Department of Justice in 1982 opened an uh, investigation, the Chinese Americans were now part of a protected class. So when we have hate speech uh, done in, uh, in the last uh, in, by Trump and his administration, a lot of people were uh, just uh, doing a lot of hate things. You know, the FBI would investigate that because it's part of a protected class, the Asian Americans, the Chinese Americans. And, and again, um, I think more and more are, are getting more realizing that. And I can tell you from the second wave of, of Chinese who I know very closely, they voted for Trump. But the second time, they said, we're not voting for Trump because he's racist and he's beating up on, on people like the Chinese, you know, and Chinese Americans. So I think there's a realization of that. Um, uh, where even among that second wave that Chang talks about and the third wave, you know, they are starting to realize it. But I, I still think that more information, more experiences that the Chinese Americans uh, face, like in the Vincent Chen uh, situation, um, they will understand it much more clearly. So, uh, Chang, you know, is there, a, is there an evolution happening? <clears throat> Do the Chinese feel a, a kinship to the African-Americans? Do they feel a kinship to the African-American movements? I mean, after all, the African American, you know, economic situation arguably has improved. Cultural situation has changed. It has evolved uh, in our lifetimes. It isn't what it was, uh, you know, 50 or 100 years ago. It's better. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, they're, they're still at the wrong end of the, of the discrimination, uh, uh, discrimination arc, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and I'm wondering if the Chinese feel the same kind of feeling um, and whether they are uh, feel that they're in a kinship. I, I tell you that, you know, the Jewish Americans, 
feel they're in a kinship with anybody who is suffering from prejudice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and it's always been the case and it's still the case today as far as I know. Uh, So query whether that same phenomenon exists in the Chinese community vis-a-vis the African-American community. Very well said. I think we are running out of time, but let's quickly respond. I do. I do a kinship to uh, all all the minorities and uh, uh, underrepresented class. And I hope that you know, the, the other Chinese American will feel the same way. Okay, well, you're right, though. We're almost out of time, so I want you guys uh, to leave to leave some last words. Um, let, let's go to you first, Chang. Um, what What is your advice to the country, and especially to Joe Biden, on how to how to minimize um, or end this kind of racial prejudice we have seen? Uh, here on Martin Luther King Day, um, and to the Chinese, and I suppose uh, the African Americans, and all of the minorities that have suffered at, at the hands of racial prejudice. What is your advice to the new administration? Well, I think that is a. Uh, I'm not sure I'm in the position to advise the new administration, but uh, I uh, do want the. Uh, I do hope the new administration will implement some. You know, regulatory policies to reverse the t- tremendous damage has been done in the past four years. And otherwise, I have total confidence in the new administration. And uh, I admire President Biden. I believe he's, he has tremendous empathy uh, and humanity and, uh, in, in, because of his personal tragedy. There, he's a people have endured so much suffering and loss. And, and uh, I, I think he's totally ready to lead this country out of the tragedy of the past four years. Yes, it has been a tragedy. Russell, let me reframe it a little bit for you to close. And that is, what advice would you give the Chinese community on, on how to look at this, all the generations? And what advice would you give the African-American community? Uh, and is it different advice? Um, what should they be doing, thinking, aspiring to in the years to come? Well, I think the main important thing is we're all Americans, no matter if we have to endure some of these pains. I think we have to just um, reach out and, you know, uh, especially for the new immigrants from the Chinese Americans, that you are in the same lot with everybody else um, and that we all have to um, kind of find common ground. Uh, You know, I think among Chinese, um, one thing that keeps them going, I would tell the African-American community, is the culture, I think. Um, I think you raised that point earlier, Jay. I think the thousands of years of culture for the Chinese is survival. Um, And they survive by looking at things like education. Um, No matter if your generation suffers, you have to do it obligation for the child and you have to save all your money to put them to school maybe it takes two generation family households to put the child to higher education you do that uh that's part of the survival and i think i just read an article that came out this morning somewhere it talked about um the, the whole fact is that as americans you know um the whole idea even for the people who protested they have to learn how to survive you know, how to survive in this world without um, doing what they did. And this whole thing about survival, it goes back to culture. And, and that makes re-examining maybe that we have to find something in our American culture to put us all together, um, to put us on the same page. And that's not going to be an easy job, but I think that's one of the things that Biden has to do. There's a, a little discussion on one of my TV channels the other day when somebody said, uh, you know, this is not who we are. This is not who the country is. Um, and, and then one of the other uh, participants in the conversation said, no, that's wrong. This is who we are. It's not who we should be, but it's who we are. And we really have to get that out of our system. There is no reason why this country cannot be exceptional and not, and not prejudiced. There's no reason. In fact, this country would be much more exceptional if we got that out of our system. And I think we all ought to work together for that. Thank you so much, Chang Wong, Russell Liu. Thanks for coming on. I'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Thank you. And, Thank and you, the Jay. world Thank will you. be Thank different. You. The world will be different in two weeks. So. Look forward to it. Yeah.